everyone had a spring break. Welcome back to uh, MVZ Lunch. I have just a, a few quick announcements. The IB seminar tomorrow at 1230 uh, in this building is Jordan Karubian from Tulane University who will be speaking on dispersal and demography of a hyperabundant neotropical palm. So that's tomorrow at 1230. ESSIG Brunch Friday at 10 is Matt Forrester uh, from the University of Nevada at Reno, uh, who will be speaking on long-term data, climate change, and prioritizing Western butterflies for conservation. Uh, and then next week uh, is uh, in, in here is, I don't have it on, oh, here it is. Uh, Corinne uh, Haining uh, uh, Laverty. Uh, from the LA County Natural History uh, Museum. And I think Carly just sent out an email about this for people to sign up uh, uh, to meet with her. Uh, she just wrote a book uh, on, um, uh, I think the title of her talk might be the title of her book, North America's Galapagos, the Historic Channel Islands uh, Biological Survey. So she just wrote a book about the, the Channel Islands and we have some really important collections from the Channel Islands and the MVZ. Uh, so her talk should be, uh, of, of interest to us. Let me just ask if there are any other announcements before I turn it over to Isaac to introduce our speaker. Okay, Isaac, That's the floor is yours. So uh, our long awaited uh, <laughs> student invited speaker today is uh, Dr. Nikki Tober, Associate Professor at the uh, Division of Biology at Kansas State University. Dr. Tilber's work focuses on functional phenotypic diversification. I didn't expand on that. Oh, on the sequel. Oh, because it's the zoom. Oh. Dr. Tilber's work focuses on functional phenotypic diversification and the evolution of reproductive isolation, primarily in pasilid fish. In particular, his lab probes the ecology and evolutionary history of sulfide loving extremophile populations of Pasilia mexicana pursuing an integrative research program that spans disciplines from geochemistry to behavior to genomics. Such a broad project requires work with many collaborators of different dif disciplines and backgrounds. Beyond a long list of scientific professionals from around the world and a cadre of successful graduate students, many fish hobbyists have been integral to Dr. Tilbler's work, providing expertise on animal care and assistance and field work. Despite the complexity of this research program, Dr. Tobler is quite active in communicating his science beyond academic journals. In 2019, he received the K-State Excellence and Engagement Award for a variety of science communication programs that he has participated in or organized. These include science communication trainings and outreach programs in collaboration with the Sunset Zoo in Manhattan, Kansas, organizing the first science communication week at K-State, and a column in the Journal of the American Library Association in which Nikki fields questions from fish hobbyists. Of course, there's much more to say about Dr. Tilbler's work than can fit into a 50 minute talk, much less a brief introduction. So let's welcome him to the MVZ and jump into a seminar entitled Replaying the Tape of Life, How Selection in Extreme Environments Leads to Predictable Evolutionary Outcomes. Thank you so much. Happy uh, two years or so late, I know, um, but I really wanted to come in person uh, and I haven't been disappointed so far as I've, I've been having a great time talking to y'all and also seeing all the awesome specimens. I think walking in and seeing that T-Rex in the morning just, uh, you know, made me very happy. And I think my daughter's really sad that she's not here because she would get the kick out of this. Um, but yeah, I changed the talk, uh, the title of the talk slightly, but I think kind of the theme of what I want to talk about is really similar. And that is, you know, how does evolution unfold and to what degree uh, are we actually able to um, A, understand and maybe even predict uh, the degree to which uh, evolution change happens. Um, and all of my life, I, I, I've been kind of drawn to systems that are uh, somewhat unusual. Um, you know, extreme environments where life is scarce, where a uh, few organisms manage to hang on and survive. And, and I got my kind of scientific career at the first in cave systems like this one here. This is the Cueva de la Zubra in Mexico. And what you see is a, a, one of these cave pools that's just kind of teeming with fish. Um, and I've, I got really kind of um, obsessed with trying to understand 
how how selection in such systems can operate in a way that remains really stark phenotypic differences uh, among adjacent populations. So what you see here is like a surface fish and a cave fish. Um, these, these fish were sampled about 40 meters apart from each other. There's no physical barriers that would prevent fish movement between these habitat types. Uh, and, and yet um, they look very, very different. And so early McCurry is primarily interested in why do they lose eyes? Why do they lose pigment? Um, but rapidly during field, field work, I, something else really caught my attention. Um, and that is uh, this one cave in Mexico exhibits really high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. And sulfide is a really peculiar chemical because it kind of has this dual effect on life. On the one hand, um, it spends life. So what you see here kind of hanging from the ceiling are actually um, microbial uh, um, communities, uh, colonies that are assimilating hydrogen sulfide from the air and they're using it like plants use sunlight to produce energy. So these are chemoautotrophic bacteria they excrete pure sulfuric acid as a metabolic byproduct. Um, and that's what the drop down here is. And um, it is really the energy base in the cave. So most caves are really uh, resource poor, uh, but the Cueva de la Zubra, the high fish densities are possible because every wet surface in the cave is literally covered with bacterial mats that serve as a food base, right? Um, and so that's kind of the positive effect of sulfur. The negative effect of sulfide is, and this is why you have to see my story mark twice here, um, uh, it kind of illustrates the, the downsides. Um, and it's just highly toxic. So we have to wear uh, appropriate protective gear to go into the cave because what sulfide does, it, it interferes with the functional of, uh, of mitochondria. It literally shuts down aerobic ATP production in your cells. And it turns out even the kind of moderate concentrations, we're talking micromolar concentrations in water, sulfide is absolutely lethal for most aquatic organisms. So I got really interested, like, how do these fish actually manage to survive? Um, and is there perhaps different ways organisms have adapted to this really kind of strong source of selection? And it turns out the cave was just not a great study system for that because there's one sulfidic cave. Well, there's actually a second one in Romania, but there's only one that actually exhibit, uh, has fish in there. And so what we kind of learned towards the end of my PhD uh, is that sulfide springs actually also occur at the surface. So this particular stream flows actually out of that, that cave I just showed you, but there's other springs started uh, not only over Latin America, but worldwide where you have groundwater dwelling up with high concentrations of sulfide. We're talking micro to millimolar concentrations that are like tens to hundreds of times higher than what usually a toxicity um, um, uh, threshold is. And so much of my early career actually was spent finding systems we can study. And once we kind of learned that there's other springs around, We've done a lot of hiking in Southern Mexico and we've found a lot of springs and sadly also a lot of springs where there's actually no fish. So they're, they're cool springs, but not ideal study systems for us. And so over the years, I was really kind of obsessed finding as many springs as we can because every spring is an evolutionary replicate, right? Um, and for me, always the holy grail was a small fish species, Pacilia thermalis. This species was described in 1863 by Steindachner, an Austrian ichthyologist. Um, and in the first description in German, it says very clearly that these fish were collected in the sulfide spring called La Esperanza, and that the, the, um, the, the booze, that the liquor uh, that the specimens were stored in still smells like sulfur uh, many years after the fish were actually collected. And so I was always dreaming of refinding these fish which were long considered kind of a synonym of a widespread species, Basilia mexicana. And I, nobody really took this very seriously. And nobody knew where these fish came from because the name was of the collection locality, which is La Esperanza, Mexico. And there's, La Esperanza means hope, right? There's like every hill is called uh, 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 hope. And so there's just no way of finding it. Um, and then uh, about 12 years ago or so, I was in, in San Francisco in a used bookstore and I found, uh, a book in German that caught my attention. Uh, it's written by uh, Carl Heller. Uh, it's called My Travels in Mexico. And it turns out Carl Heller was actually the guy that collected these Pacilia thermalis. Uh, 
back in, I think in, in 1848 or 47. And I was like, well, I've got to get, get this book, right? Maybe I can find where La Esperanza actually is. And uh, we, we narrowed down it. It's in Southern Mexico, Alaska. Um, and it's actually exactly where we work. I have worked all these years. Uh, but still, we, the, the descriptions were kind of too vague. I could recognize different landmarks. And for years, we were kind of searching for the spring. Um, one help that I didn't have, it actually says here that there's two maps included. But in lots of uh, old books, you know, people cut out the maps of the illustrations because they sell for more money. So I never had this map until um, one year, my students actually found a copy of the book uh, in the biodiversity uh, library online. And that scan had the map in it. And turns out La Esperanza Spring was only two kilometers away from the field station where we'd be staying all along. <laughs> and so in 2012, um, we finally were at this spring. And I felt like this deep, kind of deep connection to Carl Heller, which, you know, is kind of a dork, just like me. Um, and I was just like really excited to see what Priscilla Termales might look like. And so we dipped our scenes in, we caught some fish, and I thought this was awesome, right? Um, you know, their, their uh, males were black and yellow, like many other salt like spring populations. They, some fish even had these lip appendages that are characteristic for some of these populations who are even, and I was ecstatic, right? I thought this was so cool. Um, and my brother-in-law, who was also a fish biologist, who happened to be there this, uh, that year too, he's just kind of looking at me and said, dude, they look exactly like all the other mollies and sulfide springs we've collected. Why are you so excited, <laughs> right? It's, it's just all the same. Um, I kind of dampened my enthusiasm a little bit. Uh, Nate has that ability to that with me. Um, and, and even though my student later showed that this is indeed, follow genetically speaking, a distinct lineage, he also showed, Mara also showed that they are indeed kind of phenotypically like all the other mollies. And uh, you know what, argue that is something that we know in biology, right? Uh, organisms um, of very different evolutionary heritage uh, often converge on really similar phenotype. And it kind of gets to something really fundamental um, about uh, how, what we understand about evolution, about the roles that make contingencies and determinism play in shaping biodiversity on our planet. Well, on the one hand, we, we do know contingency is really important. We know drift happens, right? And we, we know that, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, historically unique moments can profoundly shape the evolution trajectory of populations. But on the other hand, we have all these evidence for convergence that suggests your perch perhaps is also deterministic forces at, at hand. And this is a, that's been a long debate in biology, right? On the one hand, you have people like Stephen Jay Gold who are vehemently uh, advocating for the role of contingencies in evolutionary processes. Um, stating essentially that, you know, more famously that uh, you could replay the tape of life over and over and over again, you would never get the same outcome twice. He was referring to humans, but uh, um, in, in generally, um, it was a, an argument about kind of the uniqueness of evolution, the unrepeatability of evolutionary processes, right? But you have an entirely different kind of school of thinking. Um, and uh, that's maybe best represented by Simon uh, Conway Morris, who examined exactly kind of the same fossil evidence that Gould did, but came to a very different conclusion. Essentially, Conway Morris argued that evolutionary change is more like a drop of water that follows kind of the, a path of least resistance, right? He argued that evolution is repeatable and thus probably predictable because there's kind of a finite number of ecological niches on, on our planet or in any given ecosystem. And there's a finite number of engineering solution to optimally exploit those different niches, right? So which is it? Is it, of course, is, is the big question, right? And so over the years, we have used these sulfide springs to get at some of these questions. What are the roles? Um, of contingency and determinism and evolution. And does evolution repeat itself as organisms colonize these extreme environments? And so much of our research is focused on a small species of fish called Pacilia mexicana or the Atlantic molly. Uh, 
And in Southern Mexico, it's a really widespread species. It occurs all over Latin America. But in Southern Mexico, we have these parallel river drainages. They kind of flow out of the Sierra Madre de Chiapas. Um, and in the foothill, we get uh, these river drainage systems are kind of dotted with these sulfitic springs that boil right into the surface. And all of these springs contain populations of Basilia mexicana. They were colonized independ independently. So if you, uh, if you plot this on a phylogeny, you see that sulfide spring population comes out, come out all over the place. Um, so we essentially have these evolutionary replicated uh, population pairs, right, where we have populations in non sulfitic waters kind of indicated in blue triangles, and then adjacent populations in, in these sulfitic habitats that allow us to compare and contrast um, how these organisms deal with these really extreme environmental conditions. And I just want to give you a, a bit of context of how this looks like on the ground. These springs are actually pretty small. This is again a Esperanza uh, Heller Spring from 1848. Um, this is the Ixtapangahoya River, and you can see the spring heads are kind of distributed here in the upper third of the spring run. And eventually that spring runs into the river. Uh, there's no physical barriers. Here's kind of the same view from the ground. Um, fish uh, should be able to swim in and out of these uh, uh, springs very easily, right? And what you can actually see here really dark, this is a dense aggregation of fish. So there's probably, you know, five, uh, 6,000 individuals packed like sardines in this, in this plume right in, in, the, in the confluence. All the springs look pretty much like this. Uh, some of them are a little larger, some of them are a little, a little smaller, uh, but all in all, kind of, the, kind of the general spring phenotype is really, really similar. Um, and one of the characteristics that all of these share, springs share in common is that we have very strongly genetically differentiated populations. So if you catch sulfide springs, fish right here in the confluence, non sulfitic fish here across the river, um, and we do some population genetic analyses, we get very strong differentiation. And this is kind of repeatable across the river drainages. Um, you see that there's a minimum or a little amount of gene, gene flow. It tends to be out of this extreme environment into the sulfitic ones, but not in the other direction. And so we've been trying to use these uh, springs, these independently colonized springs, with these strongly locally adapted ecotypes to ask, well, how do, how do they do it? How do they actually deal with the sulfide, right? And what's really convenient about sulfide is it really facilitates kind of a hypothesis-driven uh, approach because it has very clear-cut biochemi biochemical and physiological consequences. Sulfide is so toxic because I already said it interferes with mitochondria. What you essentially see here, you might remember this from IntraBio, is the ox, ox phos pathway in the inner and mitochondrial membranes, right? This is where electrons are harvested from organic substrates and they drive the creation of a, 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 a proton gradient across the inner uh, mitochondrial membrane, which ultimately allows for the pro uh, production of ATP. This is where most of the uh, energy used by cells uh, is produced. Now, sulfide is toxic because it binds to complex four. Essentially, it interrupts the electron flow, right? The electrochemical gradient falls apart, no more ATP is produced. That's why this is so deadly. Interestingly, though, sulfide can also be detoxified by all animals. All animals, us included, we have an uh, established physio, uh, physiological pathway called the sulfide quinone oxidoreductase or SQR pathway that's also mitochondrial that can essentially enzymatically oxidize sulfide to non toxic form so it can be excreted. The challenge there is it only works at really low concentrations because. As you go about your daily life, your cells produce sulfide as a byproduct of basically breaking down methionine and cysteine, and, and SQR helps to regulate uh, those internal sulfide concentrations at like nanomolar levels. It just doesn't work at higher levels. And so um, we, we hypothesized early on, so well, perhaps these fish, right, they either modify the toxicity target, so it becomes inert, or maybe they ramp up their existing detoxification pathway. You might call these predictions naive. Our first NSF reviewers definitely thought so, uh, but somehow we still convinced them to fund us. And so we spent like a few years basically 
uh, revisiting all the strings we knew, stomping around, collecting uh, tissues for all sorts of transcriptomics and kind of ecological genomics approaches. And I'm not going to throw all these genomic stuff at you. Um, long story short, that we did see some very clear patterns of convergence in terms of modifications of these um, enzymes associated with uh, um, energy production and uh, H2ST toxification. So in terms of OxFOS components, essentially, especially complex four, we see consistent and convergent amino acid substitutions in some of these key enzymes. In terms of uh, detoxification, we see very consistent upregulation, not only of SQR, but a bunch of the downstream enzymes as well. So exactly kind of what we predicted. Question then becomes, well, what does this really mean for our organisms, right? It's always neat to kind of show uh, that you have some differential expression where you predict it. You might even have some uh, amino acid substitutions where you predict it. But how do you know that those changes are really important for organismal function and ultimately for adaptation under natural conditions, right? Um, and so we have a, a lot of limitations in the system in terms of the application of functional genomics, and, but it doesn't necessarily limit uh, kind of more rigorous approaches to asking, well, what's actually the, the fitness of consequences of some of those molecular changes. And this is work primarily that has been led by Nick Bartz, a former student of mine. They really took an interest kind of um, closing the kind of the line of argumentation from uh, we see a selection uh, in the genome or we see differential expression to actually functionally testing this. And the first thing Nick did was essentially simply looking at the function of the relevant enzymes. So he uh, extracted um, mitochondria from liver tissues in our fish uh, and simply uh, did a, a cytochrome C oxidase uh, activity assay. So this is the toxicity, the direct to toxicity target complex four in the mitochondria. And to expose uh, these isolates to different sulfide concentrations, measure the activity. And what you see in blue are the non sulfide concentrations. Right? Activity goes down as sulfide goes up. That's why sulfide is so toxic. But in at least two populations, here triangles and, and, and circles, you can see that sulfide or the COX activity is maintained as sulfide increases. In these two populations, the toxicity target seems to have become inert to the uh, effects of sulfur. They took the same experiment for the detoxification enzymes, enzyme as well. Um, so again, here you have a uh, level of SQR activity uh, against the concentrations of sulfide. And you can see that the rate of detoxification in sulfidic fish is higher as compared to the non sulfidic populations here in blue. Um, Mick followed this up also on organism level assays. So he exposed fish to different concentrations of sulfide and then used a molecular probe to measure sulfide concentrations inside the mitochondria. And indeed, if you do that for sulfidic fish, uh, irrespective of con the concentration, uh, concentration is flat, meaning they can really detoxify what comes in, right? Whereas for sulfidic, non sulfidic fish, that concentration goes up, meaning you have a steady accumulation of sulfide because they just cannot keep up with the detoxification. So there's kind of both, right? There's an effect of uh, the toxicity target being modified and an effect of detoxification. And those combined um, really have an impact on ATP production of, of the fish. So what we also did, is we isolated mitochondria and measured directly measured mitochondrial respiration across a gradient of hydrogen sulfur. So it kind of gives you these response curves. It's for non sulfidic fish, kind of the response, you know, Kind of drastically declines when sulfide is present. ATP production stops. That's why sulfide is toxic. For sulfidic fish, it kind of plateaus. It decreases much slower. And to kind of measure this quantitatively, we simply calculated the area under the curve. So higher area on the curve, more tolerance, lower area on the curve, lower tolerance. And if you plot these out across different populations in different river drainages, you see that sulfidic fish uh, have consistently higher uh, tolerance and a greater ability to maintain ATP production in the presence of sulfide compared to their non sulfidic ancestors, right? So although there's some variation in exactly how they achieve it, right? Because not everybody has a resistant COX, kind of the net effect in terms of tolerance is really, really similar. And this goes 
that's really excited. So yeah, maybe evolution is predictable, right? It maybe doesn't repeat itself as solidified fish colonize this extreme environment. Um, but the thing is, these are all really closely related populations. And there's actually two ways you can go at this, at the, to the same outcome, right? Yes, this could be um, independent evolution of these tolerances in different springs. Um, it could be selection on de novo mutations. But the truth is, it could also be se selection on standing genetic variation, right? Um, and so uh, the difference between these is that um, de novo mutation is when you really have independent colonization of these different springs. Uh, and then putatively adaptive mutations pop up separately in each of uh, the evolutionary replicates. Whereas when you have selection of standing genetic variation, putatively adaptive allele might already be present at very low frequency in the ancestral population. And colonizers carry uh, over these putatively adaptive alleles. Colonizations are still independent, right? But some of the genetic variation maybe that has facilitates adaptation is carried along with this. The thing is you can test these alternative hypotheses because you can use whole genome sequencing. You can essentially chop the whole genomic sequences into little bits and ask how genomic sequences are related to one another. And if you have selection on, on uh, genome mutations, you would predict sulfide uh, alleles come out kind of separately from one another uh, in a tree. Whereas when you have selection on standing genetic variation, you would expect that putatively adaptive alleles are of monophyletic uh, 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 origin, that you form kind of a group, right? Um, and we did this, and the truth is both things happen <laughs> at once. So if you look at the mitochondrial genome, uh, some of the genes like cytochrome uh, 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 COX-3 and also COX-1, those are the genes encoding for the toxicity tolerance. We clearly see that uh, different lineages uh, essentially have uh, 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 have had different mutations that, that lead to the same effect. But if you look at SQR, for example, we see uh, there's definitely evidence for either gene flow or selection of standing so genetic, uh, genetic variation. So to me, that was kind of not super satisfying, right? It's like, yeah, this is like repeated evolution, but like the, the fundamental in innovation, right? Um, at least in terms of detoxification, it only happened once. And it's like, it's not like they had entirely different Lego sets to build these similar phenotypes. They use the same parts to basically just reassemble the same thing. And, and I, I, you know, is that repeated evolution? Yes. Um, is, it, uh, is it independent? No, it's not. And, and I was really curious how fish might do this if there's no potential for selection of standing genetic variation. And these were kind of uh, years of um, uh, stomping around the tropics paid off. Because it turns out there's not only Pacilia mexicana on sulfide springs. It turns, out, it turns out sulfide springs are more widely distributed. And throughout the Americas, they have been colonized by different lineages um, within the Pacilidae family, within this family of life-bearing fishes. Uh, so we have uh, about a dozen lineages or so that some include replicates within the same species, some are different species, some are members of different genera. And so what this allowed us to do is basically go out again, right, and ask, well, so at a broader phylogenetic scale, how do these fish do that? Um, and again, we went out, we sampled closely related and geographically proximate lineages of sulfitic and non-sulfitic populations. But just to give you kind of a, um, a phylogenetic context here, the, ba the base split here, um, in the family is dated about 40, 42 million years. So these are not closely related species. Uh, there's, there's tons of evolution that has happened as these clades diversified. And we again ask, well, to what degree do we see similarities or differences in the responses? Uh, and in our first attempt, we just threw a bunch of transcriptomics at this, sequenced all the transcriptomes, analyzed it in a um, phylogenetic comparative context and ask, what genes do show signatures of convergence in expression upon sulfide spring uh, colonization? It turns out there was about 220 of them or so. Um, what you can see here is a heat map illustrating that um, each column is a gene, each row is a phylogenetic lineage. Um, the tree on the left here shows you the similarity of uh, the expression profiles. You can see that except for one lineage, all sulfidic uh, fish 
make a, a, a group, right? Showing that they're most similar to each other. Uh, on the uh, right hand here, you can see the actual phylogenetic relationship. You can see the have evolved convergent expression patterns in these 200 or so genes. What do these genes do? Well, they're all involved in sulfide detoxification, in the regulation of aerobic versus anaerobic metabolism, sulfur metabolism and transport. So exactly the kinds of genes that we uh, established in kind of studies within Pacilia mexicana that they're actually functionally relevant for the tolerance of these fish. So maybe evolution does repeat itself, right? Maybe evolution does repeat itself in sulfide springs because there's just a lot of constraints. Maybe uh, there's only so many ways you can become adapted to sulfide. Only so many ways you can skin a cat essentially, right? Um, and, and that might be the reason why we see kind of these repeated unfolding of similar evolutionary patterns. Um, but I'm pretty sure if Gold was here, he probably would be very offended that I dare to say this. He would probably jump up, call BS and say, so, wait a second, um, don't you have like a bunch of unique changes in gene expression in your, in your populations too? Might those not be also important in adaptive processes? The truth is, right, we have a really strong confirmation bias when it comes to inferring um, convergence and, and adaptation associated with that. It's kind of circular sometimes. Oh, there's adaptation because of there's convergence and of course adaptive traits um, evolve in convergence. So, so how do we disentangle that? And so we, we use the same data that to sort of really ask what are some of these lineage specific changes? What is the more quantitative approach uh, to quantifying degrees of convergence? The way we did this, um, we basically let these lineage, our lineages evolve independently from one another and just come with some phylogenetic um, uh, um, simulations. So we had the backbone phylogeny of all of our non sophitic lineages. And rather than throwing all lineages in at once, we threw them in in a pairwise fashion, pretending that only two lineages at a time had, had been able to colonize these sulfide springs. And we then asked, well, just between do those two sulfidic lineages against the background of non sulfidic diversification, what's the de degree of convergence in, in, in gene expression and what are, are those genes involved? So we did this all for all possible pairs um, of sulfidic lineages. And it turns out variation in convergence is, is massive, right? For some lineages, you have a large amount of genes that show a uh, convergent pattern of gene expression for others. It's very few. And the question is, what explains this variation, right? So is this, is this a consequence of Gould's um, contingency? And maybe we cannot predict this variation at all? Or are there genetic or, or ecological factors that potentially shape whether there's more or less convergence, right? So um, we try to address this by making two simple correlations. For one, we try to correlate um, the degree of convergence with kind of the genetic distance between lineages. The rationale here is like that more closely related lineages presumably have more, more similar genomic architectures, perhaps even share some uh, genetic variation, right? That selection can act upon. Hence, they should have more similar responses to the same sources of selection. And if you do that, you pull out this correlation, you see that there's no correlation at all. Phylogenetic relatedness is not related to the degree of convergence. More closely related lineages do not necessarily share more similar evolutionary responses. But what about ecology? So what we also did is we quantified environmental variation across all of these sulfide springs. Not just the presence and absence of sulfide, but the actual concentrations of sulfide, oxygen, pH, uh, ionic composition of the water, larger scale uh, bioclimatic variation. Um, and we came up with a measurement of ecological similarity of, across springs. And what you see here is that the more dissimilar um, uh, the habitats of two lineages are, um, the less the degree of convergence are. So it's kind of backwards. So the more similar the environment, the more convergence you get, right? And so what we have been doing all of these years um, 
is, is, is kind of fundamentally flawed, right? We went out and pretended there's sulfide springs and then there's non-sulfidic habitats. When in fact, these tiny springs, as small as they might be, right? They actually represent really complex environments. Um, and differences between sulfidic and non-sulfidic are not just about the presence and absence of sulfide, but there are these complex environmental gradients uh, and the complexity of those gradients actually matter. It really reminded me of this quote by Lenins and uh, Lewinson from, from their uh, dialectical biologist uh, from uh, 1985. They said, for the most part, the description and analysis of, of the environment in evolutionary studies is strikingly naive compared to the understanding of the structure and processes of organisms. And I would argue now 40 years later, not only is this still true, right? In the age of genomics um, and, and functional genomics, uh, but I would argue that the only thing that's more naive than our understanding of the environment in evolutionary studies is our understanding of kind of the complex interactions, the complex feedbacks that happen between those dynamic environments and organisms in all of their complexity, right? Um, and so perhaps we need to start paying more attention to some of those complexities, not because just making things more complex is good, but because there might be some fundamental lessons about uh, how evolution works, right, in those nuances. Will this solve all the problems? Um, well, probably not, <laughs> because there's, there's also kind of a documented chasm uh, between um, Kind of patterns of convergence at phenotypic levels, even if it's just at the level of gene expression, just kind of level up from actually genetic variation, and level uh, degrees of convergence we, uh, uh, we see at the levels of genomes. Because in many systems now, right, we, even when we have st strong signatures of convergence at the phenotypic levels, we often don't find that signature at the level of genomes. And our system is no different in, in, in that regard. So, one thing we have done, for example, example is we selected three species pair that actually live in the same spring and they actually show some of the highest degrees of convergence at the level of gene expression um, and we did some gene whole genome resequencing and and ask well is there any kind of striking pattern of uh, 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 genomic convergence um, and hypothesize of course that we would see those patterns of shared genomic divergence especially in areas of genes associated with detoxification and, 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 and oxidative phosphorylation. And this is not at all what we found. Um, not only was there relatively little convergence, um, divergence across the genome was also all over the place, first of all. Um, and secondly, all the few, the, the few outlier loci we did observe, um, we mostly found that those loci were associated with immune function and to some degree with gene regulation, uh, and we certainly did not find any sort of outliers that are overtly associated with sulfide detoxification. The sole exception might be, uh, again, those two mitochondrial genes, uh, COX-1 and COX-3, which encode the center, the reactive center of the toxicity target. There we see some degree of convergence. Again, it's not universal. Plenty of species where we actually don't see any sort of mitochondrial divergence, right? But in some lineages, you see kind of similar amino acid substitutions across across very uh, uh, distant lineages. So you know, A's to T's occur multiple times, A's to S, and and so on. So definitely some convergence present. And what we're in the process of doing right now is actually using uh, some of these other non-PMX lineages to ask whether uh, these amino acid substitutions also cause COX to be inert uh, to, to make sure functionally it's actually a convergent outcome. So perhaps, right, um, there's, this actually offers a way to reconcile some of these contrasting opinions that people like Gold and Conway Morris had. Uh, perhaps Gould was right and evolution does unfold in very different ways across of these lineages, at least at a genetic level. I think this, this is no news to anyone. Like we, uh, we knew uh, since the inception of the neutral theory that contingency is really important in shaping the evolution of genomes. This is not novel, right? But perhaps Conway Morris also got it right. 
uh, and that when we are, whenever we talk about actual organismal function in the context of explicit environment, uh, and that some of that uh, randomness breaks apart, and we see actually emergent uh, patterns of predictability. And so the big question now is really, um, is it really true that across all these species, we see all these convergent phenotypes, but that they're really caused by independent uh, 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 genetic changes? So we don't have the power to really say this yet. yet. And so we're spending a, a bunch of effort right now to kind of trying to figure out, well, what is the genomic basis of some of these phenotypes across different lineages? And is it really true that maybe there's different ways of tweaking your gene regulatory network to uh, see these convergent uh, 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 changes in, in gene expression? Uh, whether that's true or not, uh, we really don't know yet. And so at the end, I just um, want to make a plug. I want to make a plug for embracing nature for what it is. It's a complex beast. We know that sulfide springs are not just defined by the presence and absence of sulfide. Um, we also know that the story I just told you is not that simple. It's not all about the mitochondria. It's not just about toxicity targets and rates of detoxification. We have shown that the, the sulfide spring fish, they diverge into really complex phenotypes. We see changes to their respira respiratory morphology and physiology. So they have bigger gills in sulfide springs. They have modified oxygen transport uh, uh, protein, which is likely a consequence of the hy hypoxia that's also present in sulfide springs. We see modif modifications to their jaw morphology and their gastrointestinal tract which are correlated with dietary shifts, going from kind of a largely chitivorous or algivorous diet in regular streams to eating these really protein-rich microbial mat, uh, mats in the sulfide springs. We see changes to their um, sensory systems and, and their, their uh, uh, brain morphology. Sulfide spring fish have comparatively tiny brains. They have changes in the expression and DNA sequences of their obstinate genes, which changes their visual systems. They have associate changes in colorations that also evolve in convergence. There's conversion evolution of reproductive life histories, where sulfide spring fish just produce a few, few large babies, whereas normal non sulfitic fish produce many small ba babies. And then there's uh, changes to the behavior of the fish, where we see uh, reductions in things like courtship and aggressive behaviors that coincide with the colonization of sulfide springs. Um, all of those things matter. All of these things also provide context for, um, you know, the expression of other apparently, uh, appear seemingly unrelated traits. And I think a big question that are really we're facing as a field is how do we embrace this complexity to ask meaningful questions about how evolution works, right? For, for a long time, we, we, we have been really successful in stripping away complexity and, and coming up with these clean reductionist stories, right? And they have taught us a lot about ev how evolution works. But there must be some added nuance uh, to the fact that neither selective gradients nor organisms are rarely ever simple. And so with this, um, I would like to uh, thank and acknowledge um, some people um, on site uh, down in southern Mexico where we work. Um, these are large, uh, this is largely uh, happening on the lands of the Soki people and some of the sites we study have religious important, uh, importance to them. And we really appreciate uh, the, um, them allowing us to not only visit the sites, but also uh, learn from them uh, about the natural history of the systems we study. So um, uh, especially uh, Diego here, I've known for almost 20 years, and I've, uh, I've learned lots uh, from him uh, about the biodiversity in Tabasco. And then I uh, have a ton of people to thank. Uh, most importantly, a lot of grad students have worked on this system in the past. So this is really their work. I'm uh, just uh, here to share it with you. Also, uh, some great collaborators want to highlight Joanna Kelly at Washington State, uh, who, who has uh, who, uh, who's been doing work together with me for a long time. And so usually I meet in San Francisco with her. I think it's the first time I'm in San Francisco without her, because we used to have our PI meetings here. Uh, but yeah, um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs>
Yes. Um, congrats, it was a great talk and also very brave to work in Tabasco with the community <laughs> and the weather of this place. <laughs> so Thank I you. have a couple of questions. Yeah. The first is if, if you uh, found trade-offs between the changing the lifespans of the species, of the populations who are living in the sulfide springs and the non-sulfide springs. And the other question is that if, I don't know, if you have explored another physiological mechanisms to, uh, to, I don't know, to permit the, the Dextosification in these species, not only the SQR yeah. metabolites. Yeah, uh, great question. So, in terms of um, kind of the lifespan of the fish in nature, we sadly don't know. So, we, we were uh, bliss blissfully ignorant about the demographic realities of these populations. And it was not for the lack of trying. Uh, one of the problems we have is that these springs are really, really stable. And so, things that are usually uh, or approaches are usually used to do like age estimations in fish, uh, they don't really work because we can, even though we can see kind of daily rings deposited, there's not enough variation in kind of the size of those deposits to infer what the age of a particular fish is. So, so we re really don't know. We, know. we know that they stay much smaller in sulfide springs, fraction of the size, but we don't know whether this is reflected in age as well. Um, and for the other questions, we have explored uh, other avenues um, uh, than SQR. So one really promising uh, pathway was AOX, which stands for um, alternative uh, uh, an alternative oxidase, which is present in, for example, uh, in, in marine invertebrates that basically allow you to maintain ATP production by using an, a different electron acceptor or an oxygen. So you're not uh, relying on complex four to keep going, uh, but that enzyme does not exist in vertebrates. We have to look in our fish and it's not present. Um, and so there's, there's lots of other physiological processes going on, but in terms of capturing sulfide and, and detoxifying it, uh, I'm not sure whether there's another thing. Um, physiologically, otherwise, these other aspects of the fish change too. Part of that is due to hypoxia. Another poor part of this is, is, is actually an, some degree, an energy limitation in these species too. Uh, and that has consequences for, for the metabolic physiology. Great questions. Yes. I, I have a few questions that are kind of unrelated, but I was curious that you said that uh, this occurs all over the world. Are there examples of egg laying fish that are in sulfide springs that are, that you could imagine there's an adaptation to the egg survival? Like, like I said, or they're always life bearing? Yeah, they're almost always life bearing. Uh, to, 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 uh, as far as we know. The spring in northern Mexico where it's actually a pupfish associated with it. Uh, but we don't know whether the pupfish uh, actually lives in the sulfitic portions of the spring. Like, I don't know how many springs I went to where people said, oh, there's a spring with fish in it. And there's a spring and there's fish. But a lot of these fish are really good They're actually choosing microhabitats where there's not actually any sulfide around. Um, one potential is in Iran, uh, there's uh, a phaneous killifish uh, um, in a putatively sulfitic spring. These are egg layers. We don't know anything about the, the, uh, the concentrations of sulfide in those habitats. And there's also another putatively sulfur cave with a, with a loach in it, a gara loach uh, that, that lives in there. But yeah, there's also located in Iran. So uh, wish I could go there, but I don't, yeah, I don't think yeah, that's an option. I was also wondering if you could make hybrids with different amounts of background variation. And then you could see survival. Like, yeah. Like, how, much, how quickly does selection happen? Right. So, we're, we're generating hybrids right now. We've been working on, uh, on this for a couple of years. It's an arduous process because they're kind of be so low. Uh, but we have decent sized hybrid populations right now. And this is definitely the objective of what we want to do with these hybrids. Hopefully, starting this summer. I hope we have enough so we can find and get some phenotype hybrids. Then, also, you know, uh, mapping them back to genetic variation. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that there's both differences in the male coloration and differences in the visual systems within the, and these are putatively convergent within these environments. Do you have any, any data on what the underlying architecture of those are, whether they're linked? No, we don't. We don't know uh, anything about that, sadly. Um, so the, 
coloration was measured independently, and then um, the inference about the visual system was actually by, by resequencing simply the opt-in and not whole genomes. So we don't have the data to address that. Uh, we, we try to essentially test some, some uh, you know, ideas of sensory drive in the system. And another piece that we couldn't get just right was we get accurate measurements of light availability in the natural habitats. So during the dry season, everything was clear. And so you know, we didn't really detect the signal. I know you saw like the sulfide springs blue most of the year, right? Uh, and when the sulfide springs are blue, the other rivers are brown. Uh, but in our measurement, it didn't come out. And so we're, we have kind of these two cool pieces of like divergence of visual system and divergence in color it correlated very obviously, but we don't know much about the underlying uh, mechanisms or about the evolutionary drivers of, of this. Just because of, yeah, going to redo a bunch of work. Yes. Um, I was curious, the um, particular amino acid changes that you noticed in FOX1 and 3, um, if those are uh, proteins that are actually encoded in the mitochondrial genome, and if so, what, well, one of the things that I was wondering is, you know, with mitochond mitochondrial genes, you've got much smaller effective population size, might be more sensitive to the rapid sweeps and selection. Um, and is that, you know, what role do you think that might have or the time scales we're looking at? I'm used to working with like really young squids. So yeah. that's a- Yeah, these are decently young. I mean, the oldest we have is about 10,000 generations. Oh, awesome. uh, yeah. The, yeah, I mean, these are great questions. Um, so the, the effective population sizes are not that small, but of course, for the mitochondria, they're much smaller. So we we had at some we thought, you know, considering the size of the spring, that high effective population sizes must be like, uh, you know, lower as for many other endangered species. They're not. They're in the thousands for all of these springs, and it's because the density of fish is just insane, right? You get up to hundreds, hundreds of individuals per square meter. Uh, it's, it's because this chemotropic primary production is just, you know, it's through the roof, you know, like it's towards massive populations. Um, in terms of, yeah, the, the modifications that we see associated with OxFOS, they're almost entirely limited to mitochondrially encoded uh, 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 proteins. Um, and, then, you know, a basic prediction would be that you get like compensatory changes in the nuclear genome too, right? Because it's, it's supposed to be coevolution between nuclear encoded and mitochondrial encoded OxFOS components. And we're not finding that really. Um, and, and so, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, there's all this hype out there right now about mitonuclear coevolution and the role it plays in the kind of causing uh, um, genetic incompatibilities to speciation. And we're totally chasing that. But so far, there's like, you know, very scant evidence this is actually happening. And I think one reason might be that we, for, for this sort uh, of, of uh, biochemical interaction that, you know, the COX-1, uh, 2, and 3, they really form the active, the re uh, reactive core of the protein. Um, the rest is essentially just scaffolding around. And, and we know where sulfide binds. It is in that, it's that copper residue, right, in the active core. And maybe you really just don't need those, those core evolution changes in our system. But yeah, I was over actively working on that, and I uh, wish I had a cool answer for you. But, um, no, but that, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, I, so far, I'm, I'm not sure whether this incompatibility, incompatibility thing is going to pay off in the long run. No, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this talk. I really love curiosity on this thing, too. Thank you so much. Thank I you. was wondering, you mentioned that there's, the population is very different between the small plate and the non small plate. I don't know if I missed it, but why the non sulfate, the, why the sulfate are not migrating to the non sulfate? Like, yeah, yeah, you didn't miss that. I took that out last night. That's a great yeah. question. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I was worried about going too long. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, we know very well why it's non sulfate fish to grow into sulfur. They just die, right? Mm -hmm. The other direction, um, and clearly there's some strong mechanism of reproductive isolation, but we're having a hard time putting our finger on that. Uh, we know there's some degree of mate choice disadvantage that sulfitic fish have in non sulfitic environments. Um, we know that they're inferior to competition. They have like slower burst speed, which probably makes them more vulnerable to predation. 
And so this whole kind of this, this uh, circumstantial evidence that they're pretty much doing worse than pretty much anything we test. But it all is like, you know, they're, you know, they're there, they're significant. But then you look at these at these uh, structure plots, right? You see how little migration there actually is, how little gene flow there actually is. And those little bits and pieces just don't seem to add up. And so uh, it's really the genetic incompatibilities, whether they're intrinsic or extrinsic, that we're chasing right now as, as a potential for, for ex explaining that. Because all the prezygotic barriers, you know, when you look at sperm competition, like whatever we've been able to, right? And there's always a little bit of a trend, but we don't understand that very well. There's clear some costs to the tolerance <clears throat> under non subject conditions. But yeah, I wish I had a concise answer to that. Have you, in, in that vein, if you measured mitochondrial function for the sulfitic fish in the absence of sulfite and compared it to mitochondrial function for the ancestral? Yeah. Yeah, we have. And the problem with some of those experiments, they're incredibly messy across replicas. And so if you notice all of our activities that were essentially standardized to one under non subject conditions, the reason we've had to do that is because there were, has been so much variability basically from one plate to the next. Uh, you know, that you have like the, with the extraction, the sulfide itself is super labile, and then with the mitochondrial ex, uh, extraction. Um, we also have to pool fish, for example, because an individual fish is, does not have enough uh, liver tissue to get the measure a workable sample with. Um, and so they yeah, have done that, but we, we cannot haven't been able to conclude or quantify the cost. Because that's another interesting aspect to that story. I didn't highlight this, but when, sul when SQR binds a sulfide molecule, right? An electron goes actually onto the crinone of the, of the, of the, of the respiratory chain. I mean, it feeds in electrons into, the, uh, into that chain. And as a consequence, it contributes to that electrochemical gradient that produces ATP. So the fish should actually be getting energy from sulfide detoxification. And one key hypothesis is that we've been having is that in sulfide fish, it should actually increase uh, 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 respiration, at least just, uh, at lower concentrations, right? That's also something we've been chasing and sort of been battling with, with methodological issues. And that's why I don't have an answer to that question. Great question, though. Yeah. How variable is the sulfide concentration over time in these stories? Uh, it's su surprisingly not very variable. Mm -hmm. um, so when you have really heavy rains, you kind of get flooding and you can uh, kind of get these temporary dips um, in sulfide concentrations. But in general, actually, uh, so our hypothesis was, you know, surely in the dry season, you get the highest concentrations because you get the lowest influx of surface water. That's actually not true. That the sulfur concentration goes slightly up during the rain season. It's probably because there's more pressure on the aquifers. You get more discharge out of the, out of the springs. Um, but yeah, so in terms of temporal variation, it's very little. Spatial variation is massive. Right, you have the you have the holes, so the, the sulfide bubbles up, uh, sulfide concentration the highest, and then uh, as you go away, you you lose sulfide constantly. Some of it goes into the air, some of it re reacts with oxygen in the water. Every time you have a little waterfall or turbulence, where there's got a uh, change for aeration, uh, aeration, you can see a drop of of the sulfide concentrations. So it's very much spatial. And in springs where we have, for example, multiple species, uh, species um, very much segregate uh, along different microhabitats with different sulfide concentrations. But in terms of temporal variations, uh, it's, it's not very much at all. Yes. I, I think that was really good. Um, in the case of uh, genes where there are uh, separate mutational origins, don't be able to determine the age of those alleles. The ones with the older ones work better as a consequence. Um, so a great question. Um, so I would say on a, I don't have an answer for an uh, on a gene basis, right? But the older, the oldest lineages definitely have the highest tolerance. Um, and the oldest lineages are definitely, in, at least within the Pistillia mexicana complex, are also the ones that have both a resistant uh, COX and uh, uh, high levels of detoxification 
some of the ancient lineages they have the most convergence essentially so it might absolutely be that you you basically collect pieces to the puzzle as you go along and evolve in the experience uh, but we don't we don't we haven't uh, quantified that very rigorously because within the Pacilia mexicana system things are either really old or really young so it's not really conducive and uh, it's just you know we have four independent origins so uh, it's hard to do that quantitatively and for much of the other lineages we don't have uh, enough data to really make those inferences at this time so we're going to redo a lot of the things we've already done on, on pmax on, on all the other lineages as well i have about two more questions <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll hold them for now. Are there any more questions from the group? Oh, sure. I'll... Yeah, that was awesome. Um, yeah, that's kind of following up on Mike's question back there. But uh, yeah, so I mean, if you, I'm wondering if you see similar patterns to what Emily's finding in our pups, where there's never mutations or sweeping after same genetic variation, and you're kind of seeing these stages, or is this everything at the same time? Uh, I, I don't know, Dan. We don't have a good enough uh, a data uh, to like we don't have enough and good enough genome sequences to uh, to tell to tell that Soon you will. we don't know. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> All you need is money these days, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, very quickly. So the I've kind of fixated on the all those springs that you looked at that didn't have fish. And so I was wondering there's amino acids, virgin amino acid substitutions, whether the nucleotide changes that are underlying those, whether those allele frequencies are higher in the population, the population that did successfully colonize, and whether those mutational distances are greater in populations that didn't successfully colonize. Great questions. We never actually look at neighboring populations and drainages where there's no colonization event, but that's a great idea. Um, what we have done is kind of something related. Um, and, you know, it's always the same suspects that colonize cell white springs. So always bacillus, and there's only certain bacillus. And so we ask the question whether some species might have certain pre adaptations that uh, facilitate the colonization. Of, uh, uh, of sulfide springs. So what we did is we collected like a bunch of species uh, in, in non-sulfitic waters. Some of them we knew are related to successful colonizers. Some of them we never find close to sulfide springs. And, and we did sulfide exposure uh, experiments and, and wanted to see how do these fish respond um, and quantified essentially uh, gill transcriptomes as we do for everything else. And, and so our hypothesis was that we would see more kind of plastic responses in successful colonizers that that kind of uh, are in the same direction as the evolutionary divergence right uh, that we observe across all big and non-state populations and that did not happen the difference was though that successful colonizers have much higher uh, uh, transcriptional uh, responses to the presence of sulfide so whereas Kind of non non successful colonizers that just upregulate a few uh, stress genes here and there. In the successful colonizers, you kind of see massive portions of of the uh, uh, of the um, of the genome changing in expression. And this, so uh, a lot of those are maladaptive, like they're opposite uh, to the changes we observe observe. But perhaps those species just have kind of the the regulatory architecture in place to respond to that sulfide, right? And then selection can act upon it. So that's the main difference with, uh, with the economy. Not a project, I need to finish. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to the students for having chosen such a wonderful speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and thanks for a great talk. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much.